What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot. Today, we're talking about two passages today, one in Micah, one in Revelation, where there's hope. We've been reading about a lot of judgment that's coming on the world, on Judah, on the nations, in Revelation, on the whole world. But now, we're going to see some hope. What's going to happen here in the book of Micah that's going to give us hope? Micah says, right now there's judgment, but one day, the mountain of the house of the Lord, people will be here, they'll be gathered, they'll be looking for the law, they'll be caring about what's righteous and what's true, and they will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So, you see what Micah's doing? He's looking past this situation where the Judeans are evil and sinful, and God is giving him the wisdom and the insight to see past that and to see one day in the future, people will serve God in righteousness. One day, the whole world will be righteous. How is that going to take place? Well, it's not going to take place before there's judgment. Verse chapter four, it says, look, there's going to be judgment. It says they don't know the thoughts of the Lord. They don't understand his plans, right? Right now you will go to Babylon. You're going to be sent off. Verse 10 says you shall go to Babylon. But after that, God's going to do something. Chapter five is really the, the coolest chapter in the book of Micah because it says at one point in time, there is going to be a town the town of Bethlehem, where, where David was from. He says, from you, you're too little to be named among the clans of Judah. You're too small of a town. But from you shall come forth for me, a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old. Think that through, from of old, from the beginning. His promised coming has been even from the beginning. And we know this is about Jesus. And we know even from Genesis chapter three, he's promised to come and crush Satan under his heel. And it says, therefore, he shall give them up until the time. When she who is in labor has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall dwell secure for he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be their peace. See what he's talking about there? He's talking about Jesus, our King. He says that someone's going to come from Bethlehem. His coming forth is from of old. He is going to shepherd the people of God, which remember, what does Jesus say in John chapter 10? He says, I am the good shepherd. I'm the one that's going to take care of you. And my sheep, the people who follow me, they hear my voice and they know me. I call them and I know everyone that's my own. Whether it's in this nation or that nation or that time or that place, God says, I know my people. And Jesus specifically says, they are my sheep and I am their shepherd. And here he says, he'll shepherd the flock of God. And furthermore, he says, he shall be their peace. And that's so true for us right now, that Jesus is our peace in a world that's not peaceful, in a world that we're constantly spiritually attacked by the devil and his angels. We know that we have our peace in Jesus. And that's what he says here. And further, one day it won't just be a peace in our hearts and a sure, steadfast hope that we have right now for the future. It will be the entirety of our reality because one day every element of our life is going to be dominated by the peace of Jesus. When we're living in a new kingdom, in his new world, then the peace of Jesus will reign forever and ever. Now, he goes on and, and says in chapter five, he says, there's going to be a remnant of the people. So not everybody, but there's going to be a select group of people from these uh, Judeans who will come back and who will be a part of that um, kingdom of God. But he says, until then, there's going to be judgment in the, in the present time. And that kind of reminds us of our New Testament reading. Chapter 11 of the book of Revelation describes two people, two witnesses that come along and they preach. And they not only preach in this evil town that it says it's called Sodom and Egypt figuratively. There's an evil town. What was it ever called? Egypt and Sodom, right? In the book of Ezekiel, we find the, the, the town of Jerusalem, because of all of its sin, is it's called those evil names, Egypt and, and Sodom. But then it says, because this is the town where its savior, the Lord, was crucified. So we really are talking about Jerusalem here. But it says these two preachers come along and they're sharing the truth about salvation and judgment. And it says the people hated them. Specifically, there's a figure that we're going to be introduced to a lot more in chapter 13 called the beast who's going to fight against them. It says he's going to conquer these two witnesses, these two lampstands. And when they are conquered, the whole world is going to throw a party. So it says that at some point that Antichrist figure is going to put these two people to death. And it says for three days, the world is going to throw a party. It says it's going to be so good for them. They're even going to exchange gifts with one another when these two righteous people are dead. 
but it says, after a while, these people will be raised to life. God will raise them up and they will live again. They'll be resurrected and then they will ascend back to God. And it says, once that takes place, there's going to be judgment. There's going to be all this terrible stuff that's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. One tenth of the city will be destroyed in an earthquake, right? People are going to fall. It says, 7,000 people will be killed, all this terrible stuff. You might say, I thought this was the, the chapter of hope. Well, verse 15 says, the seventh angel blew his trumpet. So trumpet number seven it says, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He says, all right, guys, that's it. It's happening now. Jesus is taking over. Jesus is king, which is exactly what we see in, in Micah chapter five. He's gonna shepherd his people and he will be their peace. And one day, the mountain of the house of the Lord, like that place, Zion, um, the temple, Jerusalem, that's gonna be the central focus of the world that we saw there in Micah chapter four. So this is the fulfillment. This is what we look forward to. I think when the book of First Peter says that we're supposed to set our hope fully on the revealing, the revelation of Jesus when he comes and all of his glory, that's what we're supposed to focus on right here. When all the kingdoms of the world, just like it says in the book of Daniel, are going to be smashed by the kingdom of God and God is going to take over and Jesus is going to reign there forever and ever. What's the response? Well, worship. We see that here in verse 16. It says, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign, right? Think about what it says in the, in the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, uh, verse 18. Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So as he ascends back to God, he has all the authority that God has given him. So he has the power right now. If anybody ever asked, does Jesus have the power? The answer is yes, he does. But has he taken all that power and exercised all that power and begun to reign? No, not until right here. It says that time he's going to take all of his power and begin to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. That's Psalm chapter two. The nations, why do the nations rage? Well, the sun is going to come and rule with a rod of iron. It says for the time of the dead to be judged and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and the saints who fear your name, both great and small, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. I think that's so cool because he says, look, it doesn't matter if you're famous. It doesn't matter if you're important, so to speak. It doesn't matter if you're at a big church, small church, whether you're in a prosperous nation or a less than prosperous nation. He says, if you're one of God's people, there will be a rewarding. And that's when Jesus takes his power and begins to reign because we'll live in his perfect kingdom. So that's a reward beyond anything we could ever imagine or ask for. And certainly it's a reward beyond anything we deserve. So when you see this, I want you to think, I want to pray for this day to come often. I want to be like the watchman in Isaiah chapter 62 that stands and prays, God, let your kingdom come. When's your kingdom going to come? I want to be like the widow who asks the righteous and or the unrighteous judge in Luke 18 for justice. That's what we want to be like, asking God, our righteous judge, when are you going to come? When are you going to establish your kingdom? When are you going to see your kingdom fill the whole earth and praying for God's kingdom to come? That's something we ought to do every day as we look forward for Jesus coming back. So, Thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.